unabashedly eating food during this. It's not contained by social. Hey, Faraz, uh, I'm going to get started in about 10 minutes. You're welcome to count until then. All right, welcome to our Thursday session. Um, I'm going to go through the fish review. And if you have any questions, you can uh, jump in either in chat or unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, hopefully, we can get through that. Give myself a half hour. I want to try to get done by 1 30. Um, so let's see. First, Let's make it feel a little bit normal for you. There we go. Now we're in my classroom. <clears throat> All right. So well, hold on here. Let me pull up review. So hopefully you can see that now. 
The first question is, most fish breathe using what structure? So what we're talking about is how do fish get oxygen? And the most common way that they do that is by using gills. Uh, you probably have heard of fish gills. Uh, you probably know that they have them. I know that we've mentioned a lot in the notes, but <clears throat> gills are the most common way. It is possible to use the answer lungs for some fish because some fish have air sacs that they can actually use for getting gases exchanged, getting oxygen in, getting rid of waste gases. But the most common thing is still gills. The reason that we don't give the answer skin, which we've seen diffusion uh, through the skin as a common means of getting gas exchange in many of our other groups that we've looked at, uh, this group of animals has scales that cover their skin, so their skin kind of prohibits them being able to do gas exchange through the skin. All right, the name given to jawless fish is Agnathan. I'm going to move up a little bit here. So Agnathan, the A in Agnathan means without. Natha refers to the jaw. We contrast with that with all of the other fish, which are <clears throat> as a group called the Natha stones, G-N-A-T-H-A-S-T-O-M-E, which means jawed mouth. You won't find these skeletal elements in an agnathan. Well, there you go, jaws. Uh, if they have no jaws, the thing that you won't find in their skeleton is jaws. <clears throat> Lampreys only have this type of fin, the caudal fin, that's the tail fin. Uh, if you look at the body of a lamprey, let's see if I can get fancy here with my sketch pad. Oh, not pulling up my sketch pad. Here we go. Let's try this. Uh, a lamprey has a body that is kind of snake-like. Why are you not letting me draw? <laughs> Sorry, still trying to learn some of these tools, guys. Um, <clears throat> and it is not letting me draw. And that makes me a little sad. Oh, well, uh, I'll have to work on that some other time. Uh, if you look at the body of a lamprey, it looks kind of like a snake, um, kind of a long, skinny body. And they have a little ribbon-like fin that runs along the length of the tail. Uh, we have a picture of that in this practice test. Uh, let's see if I can find this version. So this down here at the bottom, this is an image of a lamprey. And you'll notice the lamprey has a mouth with no jaws, and it has this long ribbon-like fin that runs all the way around there. That's the caudal fin because it covers the tail. <clears throat> uh, the next one refers to the body of an agnathan as being eel-like because eels, although they are not agnathans, have a very similar body type. What other creature does it? resemble an eel. You could maybe say snake-like. <clears throat> Eels are actually jawed fish and they do have jaws. One type of agnathan is the lamprey. The other one that we covered in our notes is the hagfish. Uh, the hagfish is also an agnathan, a jawless fish. Uh, let's see. Got a message saying that uh, can't see what I'm sharing on the screen. Can you guys see the review sheet with the answers? You can give me the little thumbs up emoji. Nope, you can't see it? Hmm, let me try that again, because if you can't see what I'm looking at, then that is not gonna work. How about now? Give me the thumbs up emoji if you can see it. All right, looks like everybody can see that now. Um, <clears throat> so I'll leave this up here for a second and hopefully you can 
um, read the top one at least uh, if you had didn't have a chance to get that one. All right, so uh, we, we got to what one is one type of agnathan is lamprey, the other is the hagfish. Unlike all other vertebrates, agnathans lack the structure jaws. So what we're going to see from now on out. As we continue looking at different groups of vertebrates, uh, we're going to go from here <clears throat> into looking at amphibians and then reptiles and then birds and then mammals. Every one of those vertebrates has a jaw. All right. So hopefully everybody got the first part. If you do miss any of this, I'm going to go ahead and post all of this stuff uh, to my blog for you to check out as well so you can pull up my answer key. The main skeletal support in an agnathan is the notochord. Uh, the notochord is that cartilaginous rod that runs down the length of the back. Okay, so that's what we see in the earliest uh, chordates, um, <clears throat> the urochordates, the, um, um, the, sorry, my brain is, is lapsing in memory, but urochordata is the, Am amphioxus, uh, the tunicates, uh, those very simple organisms, they all have that cartilage uh, rod that runs down the length of their body. And that becomes the, uh, the discs in our spinal column. <clears throat> These slits help to separate food from ingested water prior to passing the food into the digestive system. Uh, that is gill rakers. So gill rakers are basically you have gill arches that there's one on either side of the fish's head um, or central part of its uh, anterior end. And then those branch out into gill filaments. They look kind of like wishbones. And then each one of those has little gill rakers on it, little uh, little leaves that kind of stick out of it to give more surface area and the gill rakers that are kind of in front of the uh, lamellae which are the folds that get oxygen the gill rakers pick up food particles <clears throat> it's kind of like a filter system because you don't want the food blocking up the area that gets oxygen hagfish actually feed on dead and dying fish and they're best described as being scavengers they are not Predators, they're scavengers because they only eat dead and dying stuff. Uh, these line the mouth and surface of the tongue of the lamprey, teeth. So again, in this group, if you didn't catch that from the notes, teeth we think are modified uh, from scales of early fish and there are scales along the length of the body of most fish and the lamprey is a good example of where those scales look like they're transitioning down into teeth that line the mouth. And then they have adapted and changed a little bit in other types of fish, but we still see just like scales grow and fall off, we see teeth in some fish. Uh, sharks are a good example of this. Um, they shed their teeth. As their teeth get older, they pop off and they have new layers of teeth growing beneath just like they do with scales. All right, questions specifically over jawed fishes, which is the nathostomes, the ventral unpaired fin of the shark. Remember the ventral side in a shark is the side that's facing the substrate, the bottom of the water, so down. The downward unpaired fin is the anal fin. The skeleton of shark is made of this material. All sharks have a cartilage-based skeleton. Same with skates and rays and ratfish. Uh, they all have a cartilaginous skeleton. They belong to a group called chondrichthys, which means the cartilage fish. Another name for the tail fin is this type of fin. That's the caudal fin. Bony fish are efficient at extracting oxygen from the water because of this. It describes how the two fluids flow past each other. What they have is called counter current exchange. What that means is if the fish is going this direction, it's moving through the water that way. If it's moving through the water, that means the water is going in the opposite direction. So water is moving against the direction it's moving. 
Well, the blood flows in the direction the fish is moving from the tail to the head. So the water goes one way, the blood goes the other way, and what happens is you get oxygen taken out of the water throughout the entire length. If the water is going this way and the blood is going this way, you get, you get oxygen taken out at the front end and then eventually you stop getting oxygen taken out. They reach equilibrium, 50% oxygen dissolved in the blood, 50% oxygen dissolved in the water, and you stop getting oxygen out. Counter current exchange can make sure that continues. Sharks have four types of fins to help stabilize the animal as it swims. This is one of the unpaired fins. So one that you're probably familiar with if you've ever seen TV shows or movies with sharks, the dorsal fin, the one that moves through the water. If you've seen Jaws, uh, that one that cuts through the top of the water that everybody always uses as an indicator of a shark moving around. Uh, a bony fish with neither pectoral nor pelvic fins. Remember, pectoral fins are analogous to our arms that attach to our pectoral muscles. Pelvic fins are analogous to our uh, pelvic muscles, which attach to our legs. So pelvic fins are analogous to our legs. Uh, the eel has only a caudal fin, so no pectoral or pelvic fins. These structures on the inside of the gill arch keep the food in the mouth through filtering it and helping to protect the delicate gills. Those are the gill rakers. We mentioned that a little earlier. After leaving the heart of a fish, blood flows first to these structures. That's the gills. So the blood is getting pumped right out of the heart, which again, if you look at where the heart is located, it's kind of mm, a little bit anterior of central and it's pushing blood towards the anterior end, towards the gills, it goes through the gills, it picks up oxygen, and then it flows to the rest of the body. The plate light structures on the gill of a bony fish where the gas exchange occurs, that is the lamellae, the pharyngeal lamellae. Okay. If you're good with all of that, if you want to give me a thumbs up, I'll move on to the back page. All right, looks good. So moving on, back page. The swim bladder ultimately becomes these in terrestrial vertebrates. So the swim bladder is those little gas pockets that are used to maintain equilibrium in the fish. Think uh, like the little, if, if you were, when you were a kid, maybe you went swimming or saw little kids, or maybe you've seen little kids swimming with the little floaty things they put on their arms, the big orange floats. Um, those help you maintain buoyancy. The air is less dense than the water. So if you have those on the top part of your body, it makes you float. That's the whole idea of that. Uh, the swim bladder in the fish is basically an air pocket. They hold in air and that makes them more buoyant. They float towards the surface and they can compress the muscles around those swim bladders and make the air compress. And if they squish the air up, the air gets smaller and that means they sink more into the water. So they kind of adjust how much pressure they put on those swim bladders to adjust their buoyancy. What overlapping zigzag bands of tissue do we see in the body wall of a fish? That's the muscles. If you've ever eaten fish, it kind of flakes apart in little zigzag patterns. Those are the muscles that are in the body wall of the fish. They're really strong muscles that allow the fish to kind of move its body back and forth as it propels itself through the water. The movable flap covering fish's gills that helps pump water over the gills, operculum. If you look at a fish, You'll see on the side of its head, it's got these little things that are moving up and down and water is getting, going in their mouth and getting pushed out through those operculum coverings over their gills. Sharks don't have these. As a result, when you look at the side of a shark's head, you'll see gill slits. You'll see usually five slits on the side of the gill's head, gill, gill slits on the side of its head. Uh, you may see more. Some species of fish have more than five gill slits. I don't know if any of them have less than that. I think five is the minimum, but I could be wrong. 
The most anterior pair of fins on the side of a shark are these fins. Anterior means towards the head end. Pair means you gotta have two. That's the pectoral. The only paired fins they have are pectoral and pelvic. Pectoral is analogous to arms. Your arms are more anterior on your body than your legs. To allow better maneuverability, these fish fins now help in locomotion. Pectoral. They can actually use those fins on the side of their body to help move around. The posterior set of paired fins are called the pelvic fins. If you look at a lot of uh, bony fish that have pectoral and pelvic fins, those fins are really close together. They're not spread out. Like on our body, you might think, oh, my arms are at the top, my legs are way down at the bottom. Uh, the fish usually has uh, the pectoral fins, if this is the head end going this way, right here, and the pelvic fins are going to be just behind that. They're usually pretty close together. I think we'll see a picture of that as well. Bony fish maintain neutral buoyancy using this. Neutral buoyancy means that you don't go up or down in the water. You're just kind of hanging in one spot. That's the swim bladder. If you think back to mollusks, we talked about the nautilus that has those air pockets inside of its shell. It does the same thing with those air pockets. It's keeping itself floating neutrally buoyant in the water. If you uh, have ever seen people scuba diving or if you've ever gone scuba diving yourself, uh, one of the things that you have to try to do when you're scuba diving is maintain neutral buoyancy. You don't want to be pushed up by air or water pressure or pushed down by water pressure. You want to kind of float in one spot if you can do that. You're hovering. Another name for bony fish, uh, teleost. Teleosts are a more common name perhaps than bony fish. Um, but that refers to the bony fish as well. Is this statement true or false? Sharks lay eggs. That is true. There are shar sharks that lay eggs, but not all. Not all sharks do that, but there are some that lay eggs. Some of them give live birth. There was a video in the last section of the notes that talked about vivipary, live birth in sharks. The number of gill filaments on each gill there are, for each gill arch, there are two filaments. Then each of those filaments has those lamellae, the little folds that run down the length of it that uh, if they're preceded by gill rakers, the gill rakers get the solid particles out and then the lamellae get the oxygen. You find these inside the dorsal lobe of a shark's tail. Here's the picture of the shark. This is the dorsal lobe. If you look at the shark's skeleton, there's a skull here, and its vertebrae run down the length of the back, and they actually go up into the tail. So vertebrae go all the way up into the tail of the shark. Unlike bony fish, vertebrae go through here. Uh, they end right about here. And then the caudal fin is just all these spines with uh, kind of a webbing, webbed material between them. All right, so we can take a look at some of these pictures real quick and uh, look at some of the structures. So this is an anterior dorsal. This is a posterior dorsal. This is a caudal fin. This is an anal fin. And remember one of the characteristics of chordates is a post-anal tail. What we're talking about with the post-anal tail is gonna be the caudal fin here. These are pectoral fins. These are pelvic fins. And again, this is analogous to arms. This is analogous to legs. Kind of funny if you thought these were arms and their legs should be here if that's how they had, if they had arms and legs. So kind of weird, those fins, pelvic and pectoral, very close together. Uh, on the shark, we have anal fin. Uh, we have paired pectoral fins, a dorsal fin. Uh, this is a posterior dorsal and then caudal. Notice there's an operculum here. Notice that there are gill slits here on the shark. Notice that the shark has a jaw. The bony fish, the teleost, has a jaw. Notice that the lamprey does not and only has a caudal fin. All right, so this next part, match the following to the pictures. Which ones are chordates? Shark is a chordate, bony fish is a chordate, 
lamprey is a chordate. So they're all chordates. Agnathan, which ones have no jaw? Agnathan, A means no, that's the lamprey, C only. Nathostomes, which ones have a jaw? Sharks and bony fish have jaws. Uh, Osteichthys, that is the classification name for bony fish. B, this is the only one of these that is a bony fish. Chondrichthys means cartilage fish. Ichthys, this last part of the name, ichthys means fish. Ichthys means fish, just like ichthyology is the study of fish. Osti means bone fish. Chondry means cartilage fish. Quick note, jawless fish have cartilage skeletons too, but they are not chondrichthys. They are classified as agnathans, so they get separated before we start using this name. Which ones have jaws? Sharks and bony fish have jaws, so A and B. Which has an operculum? Only teleosts or bony fish have an operculum. Which has a cartilage skeleton? Sharks do, skates, rays, ratfish all have a cartilage skeleton. So do lampreys and hagfish. Bony skeleton. Which ones have a bony skeleton? That means hard bone, calcium carbonate, hard bone. That's B, osteichthys. All right, so some of these things link together. Osteichthys, bony skeleton, chondrichthys, cartilage skeleton. But you do have to know that agnathans also have a cartilage skeleton. All right, last part. And I've only given you three of the four terms that were on the notes, uh, but these are the main types of reproduction that we see in fish, and we're gonna see some of these again in some of our other groups. The first is ovipary. An oviparous animal lays eggs outside the body. Ovi, O-V-I, or ovo means egg. So they have eggs. Ovo vivipary. The ovo here tells you that ovovivips have eggs. Oviviparous eggs, oviviparous animals have eggs, but they stay in and hatch inside the mother. So there's another part to this. The vv part means within. So eggs within. And then the last one, vivipary. There are no eggs. The animal's uh, offspring are developed inside of the body of the animal, and they're, is, they're not contained in an, in an egg. So viviparous animals would be the same group that most mammals belong to. Human beings are viviparous. We give birth to live young. There's no egg inside of the body of a human female. There is an egg cell that gets fertilized and it grows and develops into the embryo. And there are some other tissues that we'll talk about when we get into um, mammalian reproduction, uh, but viviparous animals. Not all mammals are viviparous. There are actually some mammals that are oviparous. This is a characteristic that connects mammals to our other vertebrate relatives. All right, that is it for the review. And my plan is to have a short quiz on this on Monday. So I can answer any questions. You can work on anything you need to do. Uh, get caught up on looking at anything that you want from now till Monday. Uh, tomorrow I have office hours, so I'm available. If you have questions that you wanna email me about anything, uh, or if you have any questions now, uh, I can answer those. And if not, Monday, We'll have a little short quiz that you can do online. I'm probably gonna do that on Edmodo. Uh, <clears throat> the goal is not to make it super hard. Uh, I'll let you take it. And I think I can set it up in Edmodo so that if you, um, it, you can see your answers and if you don't like your score, you should be able to retake it, I think. Uh, if not, I'll have to figure out a way to do uh, retakes as well. Uh, but I want you to have a chance, since we're not doing tests and ATAs, um, I want you to have a chance to be successful on that. If the first chance is not successful, then we can try it again. Uh, 
So that's it, unless you guys have questions for me. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing this, go back to this. Uh, if you have a question, you can type it out. If not, uh, hopefully you have a good rest of your day and I'm gonna process this recording. Uh, looks like I got a one thumbs up and all right, and a thank you, awesome. Uh, thank you guys for checking in. I hope you guys are well. I hope your families are well. And we don't really have an end date in sight for our being isolated and stuff. So hopefully we get everything normalized and we get back to normal for next school year. Um, but let me know if you got any questions and I'm going to go ahead and stop my recording.